Okay, welcome. My name is Sharon Query. I'm the Education Coordinator in Holden Village, and it's my privilege to introduce Terry Kylo. Terry has been organizing the Interfaith webinars this week, and this is session number four. So thank you very much, Terry, for all your hard work. It's my privilege. Thank you, Sharon, and uh, welcome everybody tonight to our um, Holden Village and Paths to Understanding Interfaith Week. Of course, we all wanted to be up at Holden Village, as you can see, Rabbi Johanna is, uh, is all dressed up like she would be at Holden. I'm not, like I'm the uncool kid right now. But I just want to introduce everybody that's going to be talking tonight and talk about our, our webinar this evening and how you can participate, because we really want your questions and comments, and we'll be able to, to, to use those to help form the conversation that we have later on. Um, tonight's conversation is about the call to be a blessing to all the nations and families of the world. And... Uh, and we have with us tonight Imam Adam Jamal, who is the Imam at the largest masjid and in Washington State, the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. We also have with us Dr. Moses Penamaka, who's the Director of Theological Education for Emerging Ministries at Pacific Lutheran Seminary, which is a part of California University. Moses, welcome. And then we have with us Rabbi Johanna Kinberg, who is, has served as the Rabbi of Kolami. Uh, in Kirkland, Washington since 2014. And my name is Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor serving as the director of Paths to Understanding. So the issue that we want to get at tonight is one that, that really I think is at the heart of a lot of the issues that we have as a society and as human beings right now. And of the, of the many 10,000 wisdom traditions on the planet Earth, most have say something like uh, the teaching of the golden rule. A native spirituality, for instance, uh, teaches we are as much alive as we keep the earth alive. Zoroastrians say, do not do unto others whatever is injurious to you. Our Hindu neighbors say, this is the sum of your duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Our Confucian neighbors, if one word sums up the basis of all good conduct, it's loving kindness. Taoism says, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain, and as your neighbor's loss as your own loss. Our sick friends, of course, say, I am a stranger to no one, and no one is a stranger to me. Indeed, I am a friend to all. So the question we'll be engaging tonight is, how do our Abrahamic traditions understand love of neighbor, especially in an era of polarization, dehumanization, and disinformation? And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Rabbi Johanna Kinberg to please go first and share a few thoughts from the Jewish tradition. Thank you. So nice to be here tonight and to um, have the opportunity to talk about being a blessing to the world, um, loving one's neighbor, such important themes to be engaging in um, at this time in world history. And the story of the of the Jewish people, um, according to our retelling, it starts with this idea of be, being a blessing as a group to the world. We have um, the passage in Genesis where God says to to Abraham, "Lech lecha, go, go forth into your future. Leave the land of your father, the land of idolatry, and go forward into." Um, your destiny and what is your destiny and we have a scene a passage in the Torah in Genesis where God points up to the stars and down to the sand of this of the sea the sand on the ground the dust on the ground and says may your descendants be as numerous as the stars um, as the sands as the dust of the earth and may you be a blessing to all nations that that's what we're going forward as a family is to be a blessing to all nations and we've been struggling with how to be that blessing ever since. What does that mean in this world? Um, and the history of the Jewish people has been a difficult one in that when we've been all over the world, there have been times of peace, but there's also been a time of a lot of struggle. And it's been hard sometimes to see how this struggle is a blessing, how this struggle um, is a blessing to the world, to the people. And yet, being here in 2020, in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of um, fights for justice all over the world, and especially the United States, um, I think about, well, what role can we play 
today. Whatever role it was that we played in the past, we played in the past, but right now, that question is so alive and important. What does it mean for us to be a blessing today? And part of it is, why did we survive this long? Why are we here? We've made it through so many difficult times. And I think that part of our blessing is the story of our survival over the last 2,000 years and the ways that we've ha been we've been, had to adapt um, many ways peacefully because we were disarmed for most of that time. You know, if you think about since from the destruction of the Second Temple until 1948 in the founding of the State of Israel, um, with the exception of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Jews have had a nonviolent path. We didn't have militias. We didn't have localized armies ever. It just was not part of, we have no tradition over the last 2,000 years of organizing ourselves militarily or taking up weapons. And so I think part of our path of blessing for the world has been one of nonviolence. Um, up until 1948, in the response to the Holocaust and to the genocide, of found, founding a national state um, for Jewish people, a place of refuge, and um, and now we see also what the challenge is. How do you be a blessing when you have power, not just when you are powerless? How do you have a blessing when you have, when you have control over other people? And so this blessing of nonviolence has also become an internal challenge for the Jewish people as an, a challenge of nonviolence um, to, to say, how can we get along without shedding blood? And so that's where we are really today is that we've been walking this path of blessing Try, working to bring blessing to the world, but navigating. As I mentioned in our last um, session, what does it mean to be the other? And what does it mean to be the one who otherizes people? And how to, um, how to be a blessing in all those situations. And so um, I'm looking forward to, as I look ahead for the United States of America, I think that right now the American Jewish population has a really important role in standing up for democracy in this country and acknowledging um, how much of a blessing the United States has been for us um, and that the way that we can be a blessing in return to our society is by, um, by coming together for something that the Torah doesn't talk about, which is democracy. It's not a democracy in the Torah. That's not what it's about. And yet we see the beauty and the wisdom of what it means to establish a society in this way. And so that's my hope for the Jewish people moving forward is that we really see the blessing of democracy and pluralism in society and that we fight for that as an extension of this ancient blessing we've carried with us all this time. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Yo Thank you, Rabbi Johanna. We're just so thankful for your words and wisdom and, and I'd like to hear um, Moses, what you have to say about, about the call to be a blessing to all the nations and families of the world. Uh, thank you, Pastor Terry, and thank you, Rabbi Yohanna. I hear a echo, echo, is that? Okay, it's not there now. Um, I uh, am born and brought up in India, so I grew up in a context where uh, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, we all live together, and I must um, confess that my journey of faith has um, um, grown from initially um, out of uh, sometimes curiosity, hostility, but more towards admiration uh, and, and mutual respect for other faith traditions because I, have, I am today who I am because of my brought up in a multicultural um, Hindu con the Indian context. So I'm grateful for that. And when I think of uh, this, how can we be a blessing, when I think of what are some of the central um, teachings of Christianity, um, these are some of the things I want to share. First thing that comes to my mind is the Imagio Dei, the image of God, that we, um, like the Abrahamic tradition, believe that humanity is created in the image of God, not in a literal sense, but in the likeness. Uh, and for me, the Imagio Dei, the image of God, 
Um, I look at it theologically more in terms of our relationship with God, uh, the ultimate reality, and our neighbors, and uh, God's whole creation. So I see Imagio Day as uh, one of the central um, principles from which I see the image of God in myself, in the others, and everybody, all God's creation. The second uh, central principle to Christianity is incarnation. And incarnation is, it's, uh, it's very interesting. If God created us in the image of God, why should God become one among us? It's interesting. It can be a big debate, but for me, incarnation, um, as word becoming flesh, I like one of the gospel writers <clears throat> is John, the disciple of Christ, and he talked about incarnation, um, particularly about Jesus, of course, but he connects the word as the cosmic word, the word that is the Logos in the beginning, and then that word was with God, and then that word became flesh. And there is an interesting verse in John's gospel that talks about the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen God's glory, the glory as of God's only son, full of grace and truth. And in this, I like, the word full of grace and truth. And for me, the incarnation is not just one baby boy in Bethlehem in the manger, but all life, all life is full of grace and truth. All life is the eternal cosmic word that is taking shape in the form of life that we see and relate in this world. So I like this word how all humanity, all life, is full of grace and truth because we are connected to that cosmic logos or cosmic word or we are related to God in whose likeness we are created. The third uh, thing that I want to say is <clears throat> Jesus had many teachings and done many miracles according to our scriptures. But there are some great conversations that Jesus did that can tell us how, what was Jesus' understanding of who God is and uh, how God is to be worshipped? So Jesus had an interesting conversation with a Samaritan woman. And he says how God is spirit and those who worship God must worship God in spirit and truth. I like this reference also very much because uh, Jesus' reference to worshiping God in spirit and truth, that God does not, is not confined to any one tradition, one place, or one uh, belief. God is a spirit to be worshipped in spirit and truth. And actually, because of pandemic, I have noticed how we are not able to meet, gather in public uh, places, worship places. And even if we gather, we cannot sing or even recite some of the rituals. But uh, through the internet, thanks to the science and technology, today we are able to sit in our own homes or wherever we can be and connect to each other and worship God in a way, in spirit and truth. So um, I like how Jesus was telling uh, in this conversation with the woman, uh, how God is spirit and those who worship God must spirit worship in spirit and truth. And the last thing I want to say is uh, central to Christian faith is cross and resurrection. Of course, cross. Cross where uh, God suffers. God is hidden in the suffering. Cross through which becomes a nonviolent. I'm glad Rabbi Johanna talked about nonviolence. I look at the, the cross event as the nonviolent resistance for justice. Nonviolent resistance for justice. So cross becomes central uh, to Christian understanding. And Martin Luther, you know, I, I'm a Lutheran um, from the Lutheran tradition. Martin Luther coined this uh, theology of cross where he talks about how God is hidden 
in the suffering because of God's love and because God wants justice in this world. So based on all these, uh, some of the teachings that I highlighted, I want to say how today, um, no matter which faith tradition we belong to, but all the traditions talk about uh, being together and living together in harmony, respecting each other, and uh, have um, a quality of life, um, a life that is helpful for everybody and not harmful or hurtful to anybody else. You know, um, in India, we, um, we greet each other in, in Indian tradition. I, I remember one of my very close friends, I wanted to see if she can be part of uh, some of the conversations we are having this week and maybe in future, uh, Swamini Svatma Vidyananda. She was a disciple of um, a great Indian, um, um, I slipped out of my mind the name, uh, but she taught us how, you know, we, we greet people in India with folded hands saying Namaste. And she gave a new meaning by saying, but two different hands, uh, they're not, they are identical, but they are opposite. They come together to salute and bow down to the divine in the other. So that is the way we greet in India. And when I was talking about the image of God, our God becoming flesh full of grace and truth, and how we worship God in, in spirit and truth. I see how there is so much, it is very possible and it's very much necessary for us to live in today's world, uh, no matter with whatever tradition, religious tradition we belong to, but with mutual respect, with admiration and with openness to live, to, to learn from the other, uh, so we can live in harmony and we can see uh, the love of God that can be revealed for all of us to live in harmony with God's creation. So those are some of my thoughts, uh, Terry. Moses, thank you so much. And, and next we'd like to hear from uh, Imam Adam Jamal. Hi there, everyone. Uh, nice to be here once again. And um, thank you to Rabbi Johanna and Professor Moses for your wonderful uh, talk. I'd like to share a few traditions from the Islamic faith, um, just starting off and talking about neighbors. Um, and I guess there's also another tradition I wanted to, to talk about as well after that. Um, but I'll share, I'll, the first tradition is where the prophet Muhammad said that by God, I swear by God, uh, he is not a believer. He is not a believer. He is not a believer. He said it three times. And then someone asked him, who are you talking about, O messenger of God? And he said, the one whose neighbor does not feel safe from his evil. So that's the first person who is not a believer. And he said it three times that this person is not considered a believer if the neighbor doesn't feel safe from him. In another tradition, um, Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, he said um, that Gabriel kept telling me to treat my neighbor well, so much so that I thought that he would make my neighbor one of my inheritors, that he would tell me that all believers must regard their neighbor as one of their inheritors. So that's how much uh, Gabriel told him to treat his neighbors well. Wow. He told his companions, he said, whenever you prepare a broth, then put plenty of water in it and give some of it to your neighbors. So make more so that you can share it with those around you. Um, and then finally, the person is not a believer who, who eats their fill while their neighbor besides them goes hungry. So this idea of sharing what we have, of making the most of what we have, even if it means we have less because we have to dilute our share in order to give to someone else. So this idea of, um, and, and it's in the Quran as well, this idea of uh, preferring someone else 
over your own self, that you could eat your full and you'd be completely satisfied, but you give up some of your satisfaction to make sure that those around you um, can also provide for themselves and to fulfill their needs as well. And so I think that's some of the really um, shared, I think, things based on what Johanna said, what Moses said. Those are some of the shared things I think that we have. I don't think anyone, any religion denies that being good to your neighbor is important. And the best example of this that I can think of is that there's a tradition in our faith that said that a believer is like a light rain, that wherever it goes, it, bring, it brings blessing with it. And living here, of course, in Seattle, we're used to light rain. <laughs> and we are used to that blessing. Um, so where it's not so harsh that you have to have an umbrella. You know, I was telling my dad, he was here, he was visiting. I said, if you have an umbrella in Seattle, that means you're not from, you're not from here. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows, okay, well, that, that, that person's not from around here if they have an umbrella. Uh, there was some light rain today as well this morning. Um, but we consider that to be a mercy from God and a blessing from God. And the believer should be as such. Anything that, whether it's rain, whether it's something else, maybe for us it's a sunny day here in Washington. Um, but whatever can be beneficial, that's the way that we should be with others, regardless of their faith. There was a there was a, a, a famous tradition of, of the, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who when his neighbor, who was a, a Jewish woman, she passed away and he attended her funeral. Um, there was other Jews in the, in the city as well. And when, the, when the, the Jews were carrying the funeral to the grave, then the prophet Muhammad stood up for that funeral um, and didn't ignore it, and he respected that this was happening and that people had suffered a loss. And so his heart was with them as well, um, because they were part of his society, part of his community. And it wasn't just about, oh, this is my group, and I should only care, respect, and feel compassion for the people, and sympathy and empathy for the people in my group. Um, it's really our group, and it's a whole community and a whole society. So that's, uh, that's my, that's my uh, I guess, intro to this topic when it comes to neighbors and what I think of when I think of this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam and, and Johanna and Moses. And, you know, what's, what's been happening for me in the last five years as I have engaged uh, my Muslim neighbors, my Jewish neighbors, and people of other faith traditions, it really has led me to engage my own tradition more deeply and to recognize that Christianity is part of a larger Abrahamic tradition. And it's really caused me to think more deeply about some of the, the perspectives that I've been taught over the years, that I even was taught as a Sunday school student, uh, looking up at the, at the white Jesus carrying the lamb, you know, um, in, my, in my home church, sitting on those oak pews. I'm out in the wheat fields in eastern Washington state. And, uh, and I, 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 what I understand now is the power of, of, this, uh, of the inspiration of, of monotheism. Um, I think I grew up in a time when it was more monoreligionism. And, and there were subtle messages and sermons and Sunday school teachers that there was only one true religion and that, um, and that, and that we were it. You know, um, everything else was either false or preliminary. Um, but monotheism, so as, as such, you know, what that kind of does is it turns monotheism into monoreligionism. And it turns, uh, mo it turns, I think, monotheism on its head when we do that. Because I, I, the way I understand it now is that monotheism was, was developed in a time when, when many tribes or in-groups um, had their own god. And so when they fought, the gods fought because they were, they were really made by those different gods. Um, and so what that meant was that religion was kind of uh, a, a signal or a sign of an in-group versus many other out-groups. And what monotheism was trying to do, in my understanding, is to help us recognize, as, as Moses, as all three of you really have said, is that we're all created by the same creator. And therefore, we're all human. 
and that even if we're from a different culture or religion or you know we have we have some kind of different physical characteristics that we are still created by the image of you know created in the image of that one creator and therefore we're in this together and that and that conflict is is not inevitable or maybe conflicts is maybe is inevitable but but that coming into violence is not inevitable and so instead of there being multiple gods in, in heaven fighting it out, when we fight, there's one God saying, stop fighting. And, and then I've come to understand more deeply what the primary value of the Abrahamic tradition is. And, and that primary value is, as Johanna referenced in, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, is, is the God's primary value um, is to be a blessing to all the nations and families of the world. And that God calls communities together to join God in that, in that mission, in that, that value of blessing all the families and nations of the world. And so then what does that do to my understanding of Jesus? Well, Jesus was, you know, a leader in the Abrahamic tradition uh, as part, part of the Jewish faith um, in a time when the Romans had occupied Palestine and were were oppressing and, and warping and, and debasing the humanity of, of, of everyone there. And, uh, and Jesus um, believed and was willing to risk his life for the two, the two core teachings that sort of represent the heart of the Abrahamic traditions, which is to love God more than your tribe and tradition and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And those two teachings then are sort of the basis of, of what it means to be a blessing to all the nations and families of the earth. And that he was willing to risk his life in that very dangerous uh, context because he was faithful to those two notions. Not because God needed him to die in some kind of sacrifice thing in order for God to be able to forgive us, but, but rather that, that he was an expression of God's love and forgiveness and commitment to the healing and creation of all people, to be a blessing to all people, and was willing to risk his life to do so. And then he called upon a community of disciples to join him in that kind of risk. Not simply for ourselves, although we, do, we are called to love ourselves in that, and to work for our own well-being. But, but also to be willing to risk ourselves for the greater good, for not just our neighbor, but also the neighborhood, not just the neighborhood and our neighbor, but also our enemy and those that, that may persecute us at, at any given moment. And so I, what's happened for me is that engaging with you, Adam, what's engaging with you, Johanna, and with many other friends that I've come to know, is I've begun to see Jesus in a slightly different way. I've begun to see him as a leader within the Abrahamic traditions, um, willing to recognize the human, the human in, in people around him, in his direct neighbors, but even willing to recognize the human in his oppressors and the oppressors of his people, who were, who were of course, the Romans that were there. And so I began to see Jesus as a leader within the Abrahamic traditions. Loving God more than his tribe and tradition, loving his neighbor as he loved himself, and willing to put his life on the line and to call disciples to do the same in trust that the creator of the universe who shares that value, that mission, um, will, will one day make that mission complete, whether we see it in this lifetime or not. And so when I think about, about being a blessing to our neighbor, um, I'm thinking about Jesus in, in that way now, having understood Christianity a little bit differently after my engagement with my Muslim and Jewish and Sikh and, and, uh, and other neighbors. So um, that's, that's where I kind of want to conclude. But I, I'd like to focus a, a question just briefly for a minute. What does the word blessing mean? And particularly, and not just in linguistic terms, but in everyday life, because it seems to me at the moment that if we watch our news media, if we watch Facebook, for goodness sake, 
um, we see a lot of the opposite of blessing taking place. So I'm just really curious to, to, to hear in, in our traditions, like what's our notion of what, what, it, what a blessing is and what are some practical ways that we might live out being a blessing? In the, in the Islamic tradition, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> um, but in the Islamic tradition, there's the, the Arabic word for blessing is baraka. And I, I know you said not just the linguistic, but I guess I'll get started from the linguistic, then I can branch off into the practical. Um, but the basic idea of baraka is that something goes further than what you imagine it to go. Um, so you imagine that um, the money that you have is only going to go this far but it ends up going much further than that because God has blessed it and uh, because there's blessings in that wealth. And whereas wealth that perhaps was procured in an unethical or unprincipled way, that wealth might go very fleetingly. Um, the, the story of, uh, of people who, you know, they win via, you know, unethical means and then they lose that very quickly. And so there's this concept of baraka, this concept of blessing that that God provides for you and, and the provision that he has given you, it goes further than what you estimated. And that could be wealth. It could be your health. It could be um, your friendships, you, someone you met who you thought would just be a, just a one time hi and hello and bye kind of thing. And now you're going to hold in village with them three times, you know? So it's, <laughs> you, so there's so many examples of that kind of blessing that God put the people that God puts in your lives and, and so on. And um, uh, from a, I guess from the, the, the practical perspective, um, I would say, well, well, I guess that is the part of the practical perspective is that in real life, you feel the, you feel that there's good even in some of the evil. Right, so you, we know what this country is going through. We know what's happening, um, and maybe this is part of a purification process. Maybe um, it's part of hey, let's regroup and really appreciate how far we've come and what there is to still left to do. Maybe that's part of the process here. Maybe there's a silver lining. Maybe there's how can we make sure that this glass looks half full to us and not half empty, and how can we make the most of our situation? Um, and I think part of blessing is being able to realize, and I know it's not easy, and I know, um, you know, you don't want to let that lead you into complacency as well. So you have to keep working and keep fighting uh, for justice, um, while at the same time realizing that the evil that is perceived to be evil might end up being good, uh, or is, is going to end up being good through God's wisdom, and that whatever he permits to happen, happens for a reason. And that we might not see it now, but maybe we'll see it 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Um, but certain events in our own lives, as well as the greater kind of events in, in the world, but even just the events in our own lives, we'll come, we'll come to see how those, those events made us who we are. Johanna, I'm interested in hearing your perspective on the word blessing. Sure. Well, we also have the same word in, he in Hebrew, it's bracha. Um, so it's the same three letter root, um, which, and we actually, the, the origins of the word is related to the word for knee, because originally, like Muslims, we bent our knees in blessing and prostrated ourselves. So we associate blessing with bending of the knee and with, with going into a place of, of humble um, submission and gratitude to God. And the, the, the direction that the Jewish tradition took with the, with the concept of bracha is that we're, we're supposed to say a hundred blessings every day. So we actually have a formula for blessings. It's Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Blessed are you, eternal source of life, who dot 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 and then we have a blessing for washing your hands in the morning and for eating and for using the restroom and for you know putting on new clothes and for seeing a rainbow and for seeing an unusual looking person and for seeing a beautiful mountain i mean there's <laughs> there's a lot of blessings for different foods and so the practice of judaism um, can be called a practice of a path of blessing and the blessings are mindfulness tools their consciousness raising tool. So wait, I'm eating an apple. Okay, I say the blessing for fruit of the tree. 
you don't you don't say the same blessing for grapes that you would say for an apple you want to bless it in a very specific way that it comes from a tree and that consciousness raising um puts helps us maintain proper relationship to god and to each other by recognizing our blessings now there's there there you can move into a chauvinism though around blessing unfortunately which is you know a social darwinism that says because we're blessed we deserve to be blessed because clearly we're blessed so there we're better um and i saw recently that there was a pastor i think in i think out of atlanta who wanted to call white privilege white blessing instead of white privilege um you know to acknowledge that he wanted he wanted to acknowledge the privilege but he's also look how blessed we are that we have so much privilege we should call it white blessing and that's i would say that's moving in not not a healthy direction with the concept of blessing you know that we receive it with gratitude and humility also knowing um you know the question i yeah one might ask is why me blessed and not the other person you know this is i don't deserve this blessing necessarily i'm grateful that it fell upon me um and so that's yeah we all we have the same word as in islam bracha um and we do we have our our call to worship the baraku same word um we do bow um the the person who's leading the prayer says baraku et adonai ham barach and they bow and then the rest of the community repeats it and bows and we do know that we used to go down all the way um with foreheads to ground and we do it once a year on yom kippur now um when we do a very special prayer you'll see the much of the congregation in places and definitely the leaders go all the way down to the ground um and so we 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 always associate that word blessing with the prostrate humility position wow and so so th so there's a kind of um so this, so so a blessing is something that comes to us. It is a good beyond um, what we can imagine. It even comes through difficult times, but it's something that comes to us. And then, but but part of what what Genesis chapter twelve is saying is 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 I'm calling you to be a blessing, to be a vehicle through which you know God's God's well wishing, um, you know, comes to other people. I mean, that's kind of what I'm hearing so far. Moses, you know, what do you want to add? Yeah, I, when I think of blessing, um, you know, as I mentioned, the Indian Hindu tradition, uh, the priest blesses the devotees, the elders, the parents, teachers bless the children, the younger ones. And it's always uh, very touching to see when in India, uh, children touch the feet of their parents or teachers or elders and then the hand is put on the head to say, may you be blessed. Ashish is one of the words uh, to bless. And when I think of uh, uh, you know, that practice that shows how um, God blesses us and we bless the others. Um, I always reflected on, you know, as Christianity is influenced by the Hebrew um, you know, theology and scripture, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I always wondered why, you know, I am, I am created by God. How can I bless the Lord? Mm -hmm. God is bigger than me because of the imagery from my Indian tradition that the older folks bless the younger ones. But then I reflected and felt how bless the Lord, O oh my soul, is more to saying, to say, love God. And love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so when I think of that, blessing God is like blessing our neighbor. Loving God is, is, is realized by loving our neighbor. Loving even our enemies. There, is, there should be no enemies. To, uh, when you love the enemy, there is no more enemy or a stranger, as some of you said. So for me, when I think of uh, the blessing, um, I, it is to love, respect, and honor our neighbor, because that's what we want to do to God, who's our creator. Therefore, the ones who we love, because we love God, we also reciprocate that with our neighbor and all God's creation. 
Uh, one other thing I want to say is uh, in, in Christian tradition, we conclude the worship with the, the blessing of the triune God, the God, the creator, who created everybody, God, the redeemer, because of God only reveals, redeems us, and God, the Holy Spirit, which abides with us. So that triune God, the blessing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is very central to Christian faith. And I also want to say, uh, Rabbi Yohanna, we, we use the Aaronic blessing. And I practice to use my hands <laughs> with the, the Shah, the word, to say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you. You know, how, what do you mean by saying God's face shine on you? Recently, I read a prayer in one of the um, tool resources we have for pastors. And it says, God bends down to cradle us in God's arms. So I thought, what a great, uh, it's like a very motherly uh, way that God protects us and keeps us in God's grace. And when a mother bends to cradle the child in the arms, that's when the face is on the baby, right? So I was thinking how the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes God's face to shine on you. And God lift God's countenance upon you and, and give, you, give you peace. So this is central to all faith traditions in one way or other, whether we use the same words or not. And that is always reflected in the way we love God and love our neighbor. Bless God, bless our neighbor. Uh, so that's the same thing for me also when I say, God bless America and God bless every nation. <laughs> so those are my thoughts, uh, Terry. So I, I think the um, you know, part of it is what, what's occurring to me a little bit is this word blessing. If, if, if I'm blessing, if I, if I am sharing God's blessing with, with my neighbor, if I'm sharing God's blessing with my enemy, it's going to be a lot harder for me not to care about their well-being. That's what's kind of occurring to me here is kind of the, the heart of this. Um, you know, and so Jesus says, um, you know, pray for those that persecute you, bless those who harm you. Um, maybe that's, that's I mean, for the first time, I may be realizing that there's something very, very deep into that word blessing there. And I, which of course brings up in, in all of your comments was the word love, I believe. And, um, and I just, I think in this time where, where we've individualized love and sentimentalized love, I'm wondering what our traditions have to teach about what the word love means practically. And, and Adam, I'm wondering if, if you'd be willing to go first. Yeah, I really was muted. Um, sure, I can go first on this. Um, I, I always like hearing from, because as Johanna was speaking, Moses was speaking, there was thoughts in my mind, <laughs> things I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Because when you mentioned the actual linguistic meaning of, of bracha in, in Hebrew, it reminded me that the, the, the Arabic linguistic meaning is, um, is when a person falls to their knees or when a camel because you know the ancient Arabs loves love their camels. Uh, that when a camel is on its knees, I don't know if you've seen it, a camel how it kind of sits down with its knees bent over and then it gets up. So um, there's this idea, I guess, of submission to a degree to God's will, and um, that blessings aren't always uh, kind of how Johanna was talking about how blessings are not just because you have a blessing doesn't mean that. God is on your side because then someone who doesn't have that blessing, does that mean that God is not on their side? And there's more to it than that. And it was Muhammad who said that um, actually in a state of tragedy and in a state of, uh, of a blessing, the believer is still, uh, the believer is, has good in both ways because if a tragedy befalls them, then the believer is patient and perseveres. And when uh, something good happens, the believer is grateful for that blessing. And so in that way, both a, a great blessing can be a trial and a tribulation, because then you're tested as to how you're going to use that blessing. 
And then at the same time, a calamity or a tragedy can also be a blessing because then God looks at how um, we'll be able to persevere through that difficulty. Um, so anyway, when it comes to the meaning of love, um, I think what <clears throat> in the Quran, there is the concept of love. There's the concept of God loving people that, that do certain things, those that are persevering, those that are patient, those that love their neighbor, then God loves them. Um, <clears throat> there's that idea. And then there's this idea of compassion and mercy of God. And that as human beings, we tend to give in to this fear of God and to this, this, um, uh, this idea that God is this fearful entity. Um, and that's why every single chapter in the Quran, it begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, which means in the name of God, the most intensely merciful, the most intensely merciful, and the most permanently merciful, the most the, the always merciful. And so this idea that God's mercy is very deep and God's mercy is very broad and that he reminds us before every single chapter is 114 chapters. Some of them are uh, 50 pages. Some of them are half a page. And so before every single chapter, this is the quote that in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. There's different ways that it's translated. Um, but I think that word is also in Hebrew, Rahman. I believe that's something that exists in, uh, in Hebrew as well. Um, this idea of God being merciful. Um, the, the womb is known as the Raham, so it comes from the same root um, that there's this connection between the mother's womb and God's own love and God's own mercy that the love of a mother for their child, for her child is, is, is not equal to, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an analogy for God's love for his creation. And um, that, that's what I'm reminded of when it comes to this. So, so I, I'm, I'm hearing that, um, that love is, is something that creates the conditions for life, right? Sure. You know, so, you know, of course, the Christian scriptures are written in Greek, translated, you know, from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek, you know, and so we've got several layers of linguistic challenges going on there. But the word that's most commonly used in the Christian scripture is the word agape, which I think ha could, could more likely be translated as, as working for the well-being of your neighbor, um, risking on behalf of your neighbor, something along those lines. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, Christians have pretty sent really sentimentalized the word love to mean that as long as we, we kind of... Um, have warm feelings for someone that that's that's love right um, when I think when I think Jesus is trying to it certainly is is expressing in his life something very much deeper and that is so the way I kind of talk about love a lot of times with people is that love is the willingness to risk on behalf of not only one's own well-being but the well-being of the neighbor and the neighborhood and that that's that's kind of a but but that beautiful image of of, of the word love being related to the, to the word for womb, you know, really speaks to that kind of life giving, you know, because a, a mother gives, um, you know, her, her very body's energy and, and space for the, for the life to be created, you know? And so how can we be a womb to each other? It's a beautiful image that's, that's striking me at the moment. And, and, and Rabbi, I, I see you nodding. Would you like to go next, please? <laughs> You're, you're, you're muted, I think. It's also, I mean, it's just all such beautiful imagery and so, such needed language. I'm glad these words are being spoken tonight out loud into the world because um, we do have the same word, rachamim or, or rechem, for God's compassion. Um, also understanding when we call God rachamim, that it's the womb-like God. Um, and it's just so beautiful that, you know, Judaism and Islam carried forth these words that have survived for so long as being, you know, just important. And even though, um, you know, we, I, Hebrew is my sacred language, um, just like Arabic's the sacred language in, in Islam, then it's not necessarily the language that I speak every day. And so these words even become even more special because they're sacred words. And I just love that we have the same sacred word in Christian, in Judaism and Islam. We call God the same name and we're, 
we're about a month out into entering um, a holy season for the Jewish people, which is about 40 days long. Um, it's quite a run there. And, um, and part of that season is, ch is chanting aloud God's um, 13 attributes. And one of them is God is, um, you know, Rachamim, El Rachum V'chanun, God is loving and compassion, Erech long long-suffering, forgiving sin and iniquity. And so when we chant those 13 attributes, it's also an affirmation that we want to be God's partners and co-creators and manifesting those, those qualities in the world, that we're in covenant with the divine to bring that into the world. Judaism does not use love as much as... Um, as Christianity does, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we just, like, the Christians ran with it, and so we just backed off the love word. So we don't, ahava, the word for love in Hebrew is beautiful, it's wonderful, but we don't, we don't really use it that much in reference to God, and I think that, you know, we, we suffer, a, we suffered a crisis within, you know, the last 100 years, which was the Holocaust, and the Jewish people leaving the Holocaust, it's very, it was very hard for survivors and people who witnessed it to, to say, well, God is loving. Like, where was God? Yes, people, a lot of Jews left that experience saying, where was God? God, you know, God can't possibly exist because if there's a loving God, they you know, wouldn't have allowed Nazis to throw babies out the window of maternity hospitals. Like, that couldn't have happened. And so we've been re-understanding and regaining and reanalyzing our faith in the language that we use um, since then to, to try to redevelop a, a relationship with God, a God that, um, you know, allows in, in, in some theological terms, although we don't really embrace that as much, as would allow for something like that to happen. So we've had to sort of reframe our, our relationship with divinity in terms of God being a rewarder and punisher, because that can't really work for Jews post-Holocaust. Um, or it means that God was punishing us for all our sins and that we deserved it, if we, we, we embrace that if-then theology. Well, and, and Rabbi, I, I just, I think that, you know, some of the, the work that's, that's happening in, in Christianity is also a, a reappraisal of that word love, like, because, you know, I've, I mean, what, I, what I've said to myself and to other Christians, you know, we talk about love a lot, uh, how much we're, we're called to love people, and I sometimes say that would be nice if we did, right? That would be really good, <laughs> And, and I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of self-reflection taking place within Christianity around the Holocaust, around the, the, the death of George Floyd, around, you know, Japanese internment, around the treatment of indigenous peoples and the Chinese Exclusion Act and Islamophobia and, and, and watching the conversation about love, but also noticing how passive we often are and how in denial we are about the real condition of other human beings when Jesus was not passive, was not in denial, and did not withdraw himself into some privilege or didn't just stay in Nazareth to stay safe. And yet so often we stay in Nazareth and we're safe in our own little little churches or our own homes and, and don't, don't follow Jesus sometimes when we might. And I, I think that, that's, uh, that, that this conversation is like, something that we have to take up also as, as citizens of this country. What does it mean to love when so many folk ha are hurting and have been hurting so, from systemic and, and, and institutional injustice for so long? And so this is just such a vital conversation. Moses, what, what do you think about the word love and what it means? Yeah, I'm glad um, um, Terry already talked about agape um, I have two daughters and I used to enjoy conversation with them and I used to drive them to school, you know, before they got their licenses and they're on their own. Uh, I asked my older daughter, how does she understand love and what is her definition? And she may, came up with some profound definition similar to what you were saying. She said, dad, love is uh, to love someone knowing that someone is going to destroy you. And I thought, wow, what a profound definition. 
you know, you were talking about agape is, uh, is kind of love that is taking risk. Um, it's not expecting anything, but it's totally um, very divine. It's, it, um, you know, my daughter gave that uh, profound definition I, I really like. But what I really, when I talk about love, agape, as you mentioned, Paul uh, is an epistle, in his epistles, you know, he's a Jewish philosopher uh, and first interreligious, I, I think one of the earliest interreligious scholars, I would say, because he knew Judaism thoroughly. He tried to understand what Jesus' movement was. He defines love. And, you know, in one of the epistles to the church in Corinthians, he says, Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It does not irritate, uh, irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. You know, all these, uh, it, it, Paul comes up with this profound definition of what love is, and that is reflected in um, so many of our practices of the way we need to love ourselves and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's, that, those are some of the, my immediate um, response to you, this question of how we define love. But I appreciated uh, Imam Adam and uh, Rabbi Yohannes, um, the imagery they shared about the womb of the mother as and as a powerful image. So, and then when we want to look at how we define love, it is uh, something that we can, we can experience through action, through uh, kindness, loving kindness. You know, love is always connected to the way we act, we live and we embrace, um, we respect the other. So those, that's what I want to say. Thank you so much, Moses. And, and so in, in thinking about love then, you know, in a time where, where there's tremendous amounts of polarization, I think it was uh, Ezra Klein that said that, that our, our sort of tribalisms right now, are not, we're not only defining what tribes we're part of, what groups we're part of, what our in-group is by what we believe, we're, we're, we're defining what we believe by what in-group we're part of. Like, so we're so like into, into left and right and Republican and Democrat and, and so on. And, and so, but, but, but our, our traditions say that no matter what kind of team we're on around any particular subject, we're still neighbors. And so I'm, I'm guess I'm wondering what, what does being a neighbor mean in, in such a polarized time when everything feels like like there's you know 240 volts of electricity going through every conversation and maybe more like what what does this idea of neighbor and love of neighbor and being a blessing imply about it about our the way we enter into that space of of us versus them there's um i think uh Terry, maybe you can you can help us out here. Um, but it's uh, you're talking about the polarization, right? Yeah. And how that love interacts with that. Um, I think that there's when it comes to what's going on right now, it just feels like everyone's in their own echo chamber. You know, you 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 if you don't like something on Facebook that you see. You can just remove it, never hear from it again, that person or that entity. And it's just you and your, your echo chamber after that. And um, so you just keep hearing things that are uh, according to what you already espouse. And then you, there's lots of confirmation bias where the things that agree with your worldview, you're likely to, to confirm and to believe even if they're not true. And I don't know if you saw it, I think it was, was it yesterday or the day before, where MIT released that, that uh, fake video of Richard Nixon. Did you see that? Uh, where he's basically announcing the, 
crash or the demise of Apollo 11, when in fact Apollo 11 actually made it to the moon and back, but they were able to recreate a video, a fake video, that up until the end, there was a glitch at the end, but up until the end, you could, you could believe it was real. And so that's the age that we live in. And so how do we fight that polarization? I think it's having that, that human contact. Um, I think there's a lot of people that aren't fully on board with the polarization. And there are a lot of people that are simply sticking to a side because it's the side that maybe their friends identify with or their family identifies with. But if they were to have an actual human conversation with someone, they would be open to, to the other side. And so um, I think even the Quran talks about people who are completely closed off, completely shut off to something. And then there being a great majority of people who are still open to changing their view and hearing what the other side has to say. And then so for us to use that love and use that blessing that we do have, um, to reach out, even if it may be difficult, even if it may be hard to reach out and to do that. I think that's a, that's a huge effort. And I think I applaud, especially the work. That's why I always applaud the work that you and Anila do, where you go to those places where people don't like Muslims or don't like Islam. Um, but because of your shared connection, your shared faith, you're able to kind of open that up for them. And you've seen that change happen in front of your, your own two eyes. Um, and that's kind of, that's what led me to move here. When I heard the work that you were doing, that Anila was doing uh, with you, going to these areas that normally people are just kind of like, oh, that's them and this is us. But to actually go out and reach out and build that path to understanding, <laughs> right? Build that, <laughs> build that neighbor, neighborly bond. I think that was... That was really powerful when I heard about that because that's not just walking. That's not just talking the talk. That's actually walking the walk and being there and going out there uh, to people that you you know may not necessarily reciprocate your ideas or they don't reciprocate your ideas. And then to go out and try and um, not just convince them otherwise, but to show them that there's more to it than they might know. Well, thank you. Thank you, Adam. I'm, I'm humbled that, that you said that. And um, it is amazing to watch what happens when people meet someone and learn about a group that they're anxious about from a member of that group. Learn about that group from a member of that group. It just shifts so much, so powerfully. Um, and just, it's so, it isn't so much what we say, it's just that we're all in a room together, which of course right now was with COVID-19 is very difficult, but there is something so much, so powerful to what you're talking about in terms of making that human connection and, and our faith tradition can, can our tradition, traditions can give us a, such a deep sense of the image of God in other folk that, that we're willing to take the effort, you know, to allow that connection to happen. Um, Rabbi, any, any thoughts from you right now? Um, yeah, I was thinking, you know, I, we're, we're preparing for our high holidays, and I had to make a decision about which passages from the Torah we'll read for Rosh Hashanah. I have two choices. Um, one is the story of creation, which Rosh Hashanah commemorates the birthday of the world, the Big Bang, or the binding of Isaac, or the Muslim tradition Ishmael, but that story of, of Abraham binding his son and taking him to the top and almost slaughtering him and then God called intervening and bringing the ram and I chose the binding um, this year because I do think that while there's a value to understanding each other there's also a value to um, rejecting um, aspects of the culture that are not life-affirming and I wanted us to explore this whole idea of this norm of child sacrifice and how we no longer sacrifice our children, that that's not something we do and the child sacrifice and sacrifice as, and I wanted to bring up sacrifice in relationship to love and loving one's neighbor because sacrifice is essential to being in proper relationship to the neighbor that we need to be willing to sacrifice something on behalf of our neighbor, which brings me to mask wearing. 
because I find, I find myself personally feel feeling great polarization <laughs> towards people who don't wear masks in public. Um, and I got a mask that says love your neighbor as yourself on the mask um, because I feel so strongly about it. But that's a moment where it's, you know, where you're, you're face to face, panim al panim, like you're really facing each other. And there's, there's something being said there about how we value each other's lives. And I think that in our country, the polarization doesn't require words anymore. It's actually beyond language because of the masks, and I think that's a very interesting place to be because this isn't about a, this isn't even about having a conversation. We're not disagreeing verbally. We're fundamentally disagreeing about how we treat each other, and whether we 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 hold love your neighbor as yourself as a value or not. And some of the work, the deep spiritual work, I think for Abrahamic traditions right now is what do you do when people don't love you the way that you would love them? And we don't have in the Jewish tradition turn the other cheek. Like that's not part of our our way. Um, so what do we, you know, how do we um, approach someone who might be in, in the Hebrew is a rodef, which would be a pursuer, someone who whose behavior threatens your own and really dealing with, with polarization at like that very real level. Um, that are beyond conversations. This is, and so that's what I'm really working with and struggling with and looking to the wisdom of my tradition for now is that it, is we've gotten to the place beyond words. Well, and that, that mask issue is so real, right? Because it isn't just, do you love your neighbor? It's, do you love your neighborhood? Right. It's, so it's, it's not it's so because in Western culture, we've been so focused on love is an individual showing an act of kindness to another individual. And I think we I think we hear love in just a very individualistic way. But love of neighbor is not simply love of individual neighbors like in your neighborhood or, or even around the world. It, it, it also implies love for the neighborhood, it seems to me. And, and this idea that, that we're unwilling to set aside a certain freedom of not wearing a mask for a period of time to be able to protect not only our neighbor, but our neighborhood. Like that's a really, that's a really challenging issue. And I think, I think it's okay to love your neighbor and state, hey friend, number one, back away from me. <laughs> number two, um, do you recognize what you're doing? And I have a very significant difference from from you right now about what I'm willing to, what I value by what I do or do not put on my face to control the water droplets that may or may not carry COVID-19. So I, I so, so, um, so Mohammed, how about this, uh, this, this idea of what, what does love of neighbor or neighborhood, you know, um, how do we practically live that out today uh, in your view? Did you say, who did you call on? Moses. Moses. Oh, and please repeat that question again. Um, yeah, so, so how, how do you feel about, you know, uh, about like how practically we deal with loving our neighbor in a time of intense polarization like this? Yeah, I, I want to address that, but I want to also comment on uh, the polarization in our country and in the world, and I, I look at it uh, from slightly philosophical and theological um, perspective of how, you know, Abrahamic faith traditions talk about God as one or God as non-dual. And the whole polarization comes down to looking, perceiving the reality as dual. Now we are always constructing this binaries, good, bad, black, white, right, wrong. Uh, so, when we understand God as non-dual, uh, God as all-powerful, and when we avoid looking in the, at the world, in the binaries or with the dualism that is always problematic, um, I see that as the root cause of the problems we face in the world, uh, whether through pol polarization or the way we want to judge and take a position. So 
uh, having said that, um, how uh, sometimes I feel I struggle with this uh, question of how um, how we can exist uh, with different opinions and worldviews. How can we coexist in harmony with mutual respect and and trying to understand the other perspective? A um, lot of times it's because of our lack of knowledge of the other, the fear of the other for no reasons, and then uh, the, the privilege that we want to hold on to. It, when we try to learn from the other, listen to the other, and learn with mutual respect to the, what the other position is, um, with, the, with the understanding that we can agree to disagree, when we know that the other is not a threat, but other is also part of us. And when we can let go of our privilege and embrace the other, then uh, the polarization will, will not be a major issue as it is now. Uh, and that's where I think faith traditions uh, can give, um, do a lot of work. You know, recently at another webinar, uh, one of the panelists asked um, asked all of the participants to define uh, how do we talk about religious fluidity. You know, we we today we we all try to learn from each other. I am appreciative, uh, Rabbi uh, Johanna was referring to uh, the the good practices in other faith traditions. So we always try to. Be, be open to other faith traditions and which I, def I define religious fluidity as a freedom to embrace and engage with an any tra faith tradition that helps me to attain pure consciousness. Um, what I mean by that is oftentimes our religions, our ideologies, our worldviews restrict us and try to hold us uh, captive to that tra tradition, right? But whereas the younger generation today, they, have, they, have, they would like to have the freedom to embrace and engage with other traditions that, has, that have their own worldviews and that um, help us look at the unicity. I mean, if I'm using the, the Islamic, uh, the non-duality, uh, or the Indian philosophy, Advaitan, non-duality dual, non of the ultimate reality, which for me is pure consciousness, which for me is the truth, which for me is the spirit. That is non-dual. It's more, monotheism is not the right um, word to explain that. So um, there is so much that we can do uh, all faiths and ideologies to come together, to learn from one another, to respect the other, and, and be able to do that love we are talking about that's willing to take risk and let go of, of that we want to hold on to thinking that that will keep us safe and, and well. You know, I, I, th I think, I think some, some parts of what I'm hearing from all of us, you know, partly is that a lot of log a lot of people out there f feel, and sometimes I find myself drawn into this trap of thinking that there's only two options. And, but there are many options for how we can handle the issues and challenges that are ahead of us. There's more than two, right? Um, and and this, that, that kind of thinking get, gets us into a team-oriented uh, sort of approach sometimes, which then continues to polarize us. But I also think that I also think that there are people who are in a, in a place at the moment where they're not ready to listen or to engage in conversation. And, uh, and I think we need to give ourselves permission to recognize when folk are more or less ready to engage in conversation with us and put ourselves into conversation with folk that are willing or persuadable or somewhat open and not think so much about how we can change the mind of someone who has a diametrically opposed opinion to us at the moment. 
because I, I think there's something very impatient about, about a lot of our work, a lot of my work even, where I just, I want to convince them and I want to get them, I, I want us to come to agreement and I want, I want the conflict to stop, but it's not going to stop if we're trying to convince other people, trying to change other people's minds. There, there's got to be another approach here. And we actually have two questions from two different folk, one on Facebook uh, from Laura and one, one on, um, on Zoom from Sue Ellen about like, okay, so what do our traditions suggest about how can we actually manage that conversation with folk that are, are persuadable, you know, that, that are so, somewhat open, but maybe of a different, uh, a different point of view. I think from a, a progressive -y kind of Lutheran Christian perspective, there are moments when I hear us speaking incredibly negatively about evangelicals or more conservative Christians in ways that do not help this polarization, that are just a, a signal, a sign of it. And so I think we've got to do some work to recognize that we still share a lot in common with, with our fellow Christians, but we've got, to, we've got to calm down a little bit enough to be able to listen to like what they're going through and what they're feeling. And, and so I'm just interested in hearing what gifts we have to bring to this, to this, to how we frame those kind of conversations. I wanted to respond also to your idea of there being lots of different approaches and there's not just two ways. And just to note that one of the pathways for, for Jews and survival in dealing with um, polarization or conflict or what often what we experience would, as would be oppression um, actually is very, has not come up, but it's to move away. Hmm that has been our path is when 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 the culture changed and when the tides turned and when we saw that the ideas of the people who we were living around it was no longer a hospitable environment we moved and looked for a hospitable environment so instead of trying to change the people who we were living around because that wasn't going to work we were just going to get murdered um we moved somewhere else if you think about fiddler on the roof in the last story you know the last scene in anatevka of people packing up and moving away and so there's a lot of different approaches, but I will say that for, for Jews, moving away is, is, is often, okay, this is not a safe place for us. This is not a healthy environment. Um, where can we go next? Because as human beings, we were created to be extremely adaptable. So unlike a certain frog that lives in a certain river in a certain place that can't survive any other environment, human beings were made so that we can live anywhere on this planet and survive and thrive, we're adaptable like that. And so I just know for our people that while we have, we do have histories of engaging in dialogue, Rashi, um, the um, medieval French Jewish scholar famously debated Christian scholars, but that did not, um, the dialogue and the debate has not necessarily led, except until we got to the United States, where we're currently right now in a golden age of interfaith interaction. So this right now represents what we're doing and what's happening, represents the golden age of interfaith interaction probably in world history. This is the pinnacle. And yet, I know for myself and, and other Jews, we wonder, okay, where's our next place that we're going to live? Is, this, is the United States of America going to be the place where we're going to actually be able to find a, or is there another part of the world? And so, because we want to live um, with people who share, we share values with. Well, Sister Johanna, I, I hope that I'm among the Christians and fellow human beings and Americans that are willing to stand with you so you don't have to move because I would grieve if that happened. Um, and I, I also just want to say that, that, that Eric, that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the attendees said that Move Away reminds um, him of the, uh, reminds that person, I'm not sure if it's male or female, so sorry about that, of uh, the direction given to the disciples to shake the dust from their sandals and move on if the conversation's not moving forward. Because we only have so much energy after all. Um, so that was an interesting interesting comment. Uh, um, Adam, how about you? Your, your, your mic is off there. Yeah, I think there is, there is that point where you have to decide when to move on as, um, 
uh, April, I think is it April in the chat you mentioned. Um, um, there is that point where you have to decide to move on. And um, the Quran talks about guidance and says that guidance is in the hands of God. And that um, in, in the Quran, uh, God says to Muhammad, and so Muhammad is, is a great prophet. He's the, the final messenger of God. He's the role model for all of those who adhere to the Muslim faith, the Islamic faith. And um, God tells him that you don't get to guide who you want. You don't get to guide who you want. Rather, it is, a, it is God who, who guides who he wants. And so there's this idea that we have to do our part in terms of getting the message across and then leaving the rest to God as to whether it sticks or not. We can do our best to try and make it sticky, to make it uh, convincing, to make it persuasive, uh, to make it compassionate, try our best to, on, our, on our part to do our part with that message. But then realizing that there comes a point where we've done what's within our capacity, what's within our ability, and to leave the rest of that to God. And I think that comes with any decision that we make in our lives, that there's, there's that, like when we drive a car, we drive in a way that keeps us safe, we drive according to the speed limit, or a few miles below, like Terry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was just the uh, joke from our trip to Holden, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, 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 but the, you know, just staying, we, we, we drive at the speed limit, we, we make sure we don't cross any red lights, we make sure we do what's at the, within our capacity, and then leave the rest to God in terms of keeping us safe from any accidents. And that if those do happen, um, uh, to realize that, um, at least in our faith, what we believe is that God wanted that to happen. Might, maybe he saved us from something that could have been worse. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of that in terms of knowing that, realizing that there's God's wisdom in there somehow, uh, even if we may not see it. And so similarly, when it comes to dealing with people, are we doing what's within our capacity? Are we doing our best? Have we done our part? And then leaving the rest to God, for him to guide, for him to take them the rest of the way, uh, for them to go on their journey and continue on their journey that they're on. Yeah, so if, if God is compassionate and merciful and we're made in the image of that God, if God is the one who creates, uh, you know, the 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 womb-like universe and community which nurtures life, then we can we do that? How can we not lead with anger and difference and you know I'm going to confront you, but with compassion and, and a capacity for listening, knowing that we have only a limited capacity to do that, and we may need and, break breaks from that from that kind of conversation too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and and the thing is, right now, it feels to me like it's it's become much more difficult because we've lost that ability. Uh, and so we need initiatives such as this. We need initiatives led by uh, people that are in the majority um, to to kind of get that platform for us to get those ideas out there and those words out there. Yeah. Moses, what do you think about how we can move forward in conversation with people today in this in this polarized environment? Yeah, I, you know, some of the things that I came to my mind in listening to you is uh, we need to be, we have the potential to move from conflict to communion, from hostility to harmony. We don't have to hide, run, and leave. Um, we, you know, listening, as somebody was saying, whether if we already moved in the conversation, how can we listen? And listening as an active, non-resistant, non-violent resistance movement. Uh, there is action. In, in listening is not just uh, these conversations, but we, we need to join our hands and our hearts together to participate in non-violent, resistance. That's for me cross. Cross is where God is present. God is present in that suffering for justice. And that can be done through all of us um, reaching out to each other, no matter which faith tradition, Abrahamic or not, or, you know, American Indian, Native, Indigenous 
and even island spiritualities that can all come together and work for justice, for equity, for inclusion. And that can make us move from conflict to communion. I really appreciate that, Moses. And I think as we're, as we're getting close to wrapping up, we'll have a brief devotion from Moses in just a few minutes. You know, what I, I try to remember a couple things when I'm in conversation with people. I mean, I, I try to find some common values in, in the listening that I bring. I, I, try to, I try to put myself in their shoes and understand what the pain that they're expressing and that they're, they're experiencing. I try to recognize some of the anger that they may be experiencing. Um, in this way that usually what we're angry about is based on something that we love. And so, you know, what I've noticed in trying to counter Islamophobia or anti-Semitism is that people are afraid uh, of, of something on the basis of feeling that something they love is being threatened. And then when I show them that I value the same thing that they value and that their Muslim and Jewish neighbors value the same thing that they value, it really changes the conversation. But I also have to remember this, that those conversations don't, um, don't often bear fruit right away, just the same way a seed in a garden or a, a, fruit tr a fruit tree nut doesn't bear fruit right away. It takes a long time. And that instead of arguing with people, a lot of deep listening is, is best. And, and then sharing a simple positive story about your Jewish neighbor, about your Muslim neighbor, about your sick neighbor, or whoever else. Is, is a question at the moment and share that positive story, which brings us back to that word blessing, I think, doesn't it? Because the word blessing is about, you know, speaking a positive word of, of God's like beautiful, abundant, uh, beyond our imagination, womb-like life-giving quality, right? In a way that helps to reduce the fear. And again, it doesn't, it's not magic. It doesn't have effect right away. But, but I'll just tell a brief story. There was a man in a, in a church not far from here. Uh, he and three people, three other men, sent an email out to the entire church warning them that I was coming and that I was going to try to spread some, some crazy stuff about Muslims being okay. <laughs> and uh, the pastors tried to deal with that and other people in the church tried to deal with that. And I had conversation with the three men after church. It was quite vigorous. Uh, but then I got a note about a year later from one of them saying that he had actually met a Muslim, that his daughter had been talking to him about his views, and that he'd had a change of heart after hearing a lot of the positive contributions of Muslims in, in America. And that took a year. So sometimes we just get too impatient. We want it all to happen right now. Like, clicking something I'd like on Facebook. It just ain't going to happen that way. Well, I just want to say I, I so much appreciate this conversation tonight, Johanna and Adam and, and, and Moses. Um, is there anything that anybody would like to say to kind of close us off before we do the, uh, the brief devotions? Or are we okay? Okay, Moses, go ahead and, uh, and share some brief devotions with us before we, we close up tonight. Yes, uh, thank you. Am I muted? We can hear you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I'd like to, with the... Oh, now we can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Uh, with the permission of my Jewish siblings and Hindu siblings, I want to read a prophecy from Isaiah, uh, chapter 2, verses few, 2 to 4, and close with a blessing from a Hindu um, prayer for the total well-being of the universe. These are the words of the words of Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In, in, in days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways and that we may walk in the paths of God. 
for out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the words of the Lord from Jerusalem. God shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up swords against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is my favorite. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Uh, these are the words of prophet Isaiah. And the words, uh, even though Isaiah is prophesizing to Judah and talking about Jerusalem from where the teachings come from the nations, what is uh, he talking about, prophesizing here as a, about uh, the love, the peace, and the justice that we are all talking about, where there is no need to learn war. I want to conclude with the Sanskrit prayer. I will read um, this, uh, um, the Sanskrit prayer, and I'll tell the meaning. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Badrani Paschantu Ma Kaschid Dukha Bhag Bhave Om Shantihi 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 The meaning of this prayer is Om the cosmic uh, source of all life, may all be blessed and happy. May all be free from illness. May all see what is auspicious. May no one suffer. Om peace, om peace, om peace. Thank you so much, Moses. And, and Adam and Johanna, thank you so much for this conversation. It's, there's a lot that I'm going to be thinking about in the coming days. We'll be gathering uh, tomorrow night uh, with Amina Qureshi and R Reiner Waldman Atkins for some coaching around um, around the artwork that people have been working on. And then Adam, Johanna, and Moses and I will be joining uh, all of you on Friday to have a conversation about, about uh, human beings as a part of the ecosystem. And that's a really critical conversation right now. And we invite you all to join us and invite a friend or two to join us as well. We thank Holden Village for, Interfaith, for uh, sponsoring Interfaith Week with Paths to Understanding. We look forward to being up at Holden Village with all of you next year. And uh, we'll look forward to more conversation this week. And until then, be well, be kind, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you for watching.